estamos então ao vivo, ok, we're live now, é, eu vou falar um pouco em português e um pouco em inglês, só para contextualizar o nosso evento, I'm going to speak a little bit in Portuguese, a little bit in English, so I can context to our uh, event, this webinar, uh, uh, here in the CIFI, where we have our uh, 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 regional labor court of the sixth region and our postgraduate program in law at the Catholic University of Pernambuco, we decided to unite to uh, prepare a series of webinars. And our basic uh, objective was to create a dialogue between Brazilians and professors and specialists abroad to talk about uh, subjects of law that have some sort of relation to the impacts that our society or society is feeling through the COVID uh, pandemic. And so this is basically our way of speaking to the world and learning from the experiences of others who are facing tough times such as us. A ideia básica aqui, então, é, foi objeto de uma reunião do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Direito da Universidade Católica de Pernambuco e da Escola Judicial do Tribunal Regional do Trabalho da Sexta Região, que uniram forças com o objetivo de permitir a criação de um diálogo internacional com pessoas é, de outros países, para que pudéssemos ter uma troca de experiências envolvendo é, aquilo que nós estamos enfrentando durante essa pandemia, especificamente em relação a temas jurídicos decorrentes dos impactos gerados pelo coronavírus. E nós tivemos, então, o nosso primeiro evento na semana passada e esse é o nosso segundo evento. Nós temos duas convidadas muito especiais. Eu vou, inicialmente, fazer essa exposição, como disse, em português e em inglês. Depois, quando a, a primeira é, palestrante começar a falar, aí eu irei para o meu Instagram, vocês vão receber aí o número que está embaixo agora, para poder, então, acompanhar a tradução que eu farei da respectiva apresentação. É, eu gostaria, então, de agradecer ao presidente do Tribunal Regional do Trabalho, desembargador Valdir Carvalho, ao diretor da Escola Judicial do TRT6, o desembargador Ivan Valença, aos coordenadores do, do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Direito, o professor Raimundo Juliano e a professora Érica Babini, por permitir a realização deste evento, que, que é muito importante para todos nós, é, e permitir, então, o início desse diálogo que desejamos que se torne permanente com professores e especialistas de outros países. I would like to thank the Chief Justice of our Regional Labor Court here in Pernambuco, Dr. Valdi Carvalho, uh, Justice Ivan Valença, who is the director of our Judicial School here in Recife, and the coordinators of our postgraduate program in law, uh, Professor Raimundo Giuliano and Professor Erica Babini, for the support they gave for us to be able to have this event. And this event, it is very, very special for multiple reasons. I have here with me uh, my dear friend and colleague from the postgraduate program in law at the Catholic University of Pernambuco, Professor Gustavo Santos, who, who's in this in my screen right below me. And we have two very special women, very special professors, very special uh, 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 persons who have uh, knowledge that I am sure that is going to add to what we are feeling, to what we are seeing, and and to share their experiences in a very tough situation as the one which we are living in now. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Professor Susan Simone Kang. She is a professor at the Boston College. She's extremely famous here in Brazil. I was telling her she should think about running for office here she'd have a great a great chance because she's actually full of brazilian fans okay and this a special reason also that, that, that about her today which i will hint on later on before she speaks and our uh second our first speaker who will speak first is professor daniela rosa who is fluent both in english and spanish she will be giving her speech in english and i will be doing both translation uh, uh, Professor Daniela is also a very, very, very special person, and we are very honored to have her here. She is going to share her experience in access to justice and human rights, and she will be using a PowerPoint, which will, I uh, think, help a lot uh, during the, the the showing of her speech, of, of, of the themes that she will 
uh, exam. And so we will start in this situation with uh, Professor Daniela. Afterwards, Professor Gustavo will uh, uh, have some questions and he will put in some context to what was said. Afterwards, we will have uh, Professor Susan give her speech, give her lecture. And then once again, Professor Gustavo will uh, have a, a mini interview with some questions that Professor Susan will answer. I will try to be like a moderator between because I have double duty. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we call it here, uh, Susan and Daniela, acumulo de funções. No, I have extra uh, 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 stuff to do. I have to double my workload here because I'm also going to be a translator. So what we will do now is I will give the mic to Prof uh, Professor Daniela, which is a great honor for our judicial school and for our postgraduate in law program at the Catholic University to have you in this event. Uh, and we are very, very, very pleased, very honored, very happy to have you here. And she will uh, start her lecture and I will mute myself here and I will go to my Instagram, which you see below, if you prefer to, uh, to, to hear it in Portuguese, ok? Então, doutores, eu fiz a apresentação, nós temos então esses três pessoas maravilhosas aqui, meu colega Gustavo Santos aí embaixo, aqui a professora Susan Simone Candy da Boston College, College, que é uma professora maravilhosa, e eu disse que ela é tão amada aqui no Brasil que ela deveria pensar em concorrer nas próximas eleições, porque acho que teria chance imensa de ser eleita para qualquer cargo público aqui. Ela é muito amada aqui. Tem um motivo especial também sobre ela, que eu vou falar antes da exposição dela. Mas antes da professora Susan, quem vai falar é a professora Daniela Urosa, que também é professora do Boston College, é um especialista no tema acesso à justiça e direitos humanos e vai nos brindar com uma palestra absolutamente maravilhosa. Após cada exposição, o professor Gustavo vai intervir, fazendo alguns questionamentos, algumas perguntas, às duas palestrantes convidadas. Ok, doutores? Então, o sistema vai ser esse. Eu vou, então, colocar no mute agora e vou entrar nesse meu acúmulo de funções para atuar como tradutor durante a exposição, primeiro, da professora é, Daniela e depois da professora Susan. Ok? Então, eu vou... Colocar o mute aqui, tá bom? E vou deixar vocês inicialmente, então, aqui com a professora Daniela, enquanto para o Instagram. Até mais. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Let's see. Ok. I think Sergio is. Is, is ready, Professor Torres. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Sergio Torres, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Gustavo Ferreira Santos, for this kind invitation. Uh, it's for me a real honor and a real pleasure to be here with you today. And also it's a real pleasure uh, for me to share this panel with my dear colleague and friend, uh, Professor Susan Simone. Uh, to talk about a <clears throat> very, very interesting topic, how is the access to justice, human rights, and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. Um, I want to share with you today a few ideas uh, about access to justice, human rights protection, COVID-19 pandemic, from the perspective of the inter-American system of human rights, that is, really important for both uh, Brazil and the United States in a different level, but it's, it's really, really important for both. So I think we can start with the first slides. Okay, great, thank you. I think uh, as an introduction, uh, we have to start saying that the COVID-19 pandemic is definitely an unprecedented and sudden situation which increased the vulnerability of human rights. Uh, the pandemic has an unprecedented global effect. I think everybody agree that uh, everything worldwide, public health, economy, politics, education, employment, science, technology, among so many other areas of our life is definitely uh, affected by the pandemic in both, in an individual and in a global perspective. And it has a direct consequences in the human rights protection, definitely. 
Uh, first, of course, the right to life, the right to health, and the right of personal integrity uh, of any person practically in the world is currently under threat. But it's not only a problem of right to life and right to health. Uh, there is an increasing limitation of freedoms and civil rights. Uh, we are talking about the freedom of transit, freedom of assembly, a right to protest. Uh, all the practically all the freedoms and civil rights has been limited by the state of emergency, the state of alarm, and a state of a cat catastrophe that has been declared in almost any country that is affected uh, by the pandemic. Uh, and a special concern, of course, is in the countries that that are under authoritarian rulers or that has a government with an authoritarian, authoritarian style. In that cases, uh, all, all, also the personal liberty, the freedom of expression, uh, the transparency is under Minais. For example, so many journalists have been in jail in, in different countries just because they show or publish information regarding the pandemic. So, so many, uh, traditional freedoms and civil and political rights are limited. But also, on the other hand, we have a huge problem with social and economic rights. During the pandemic, uh, social and economic rights are probably weaker than before. Right to life, uh, right to health, sorry, uh, the right to access to a quality public health system, the right to education, almost every uh, a school and university in the countries that are uh, affected by the pandemic are closed. Some of them switch to an online education, but most of them, probably 60 or 70% of the schools and university are closed, so their right to education <clears throat> is limited. Labor rights, of course, are limited during the pandemic, technology access. So uh, we have a if the inequality have been always a problem for social and economic rights, now the inequality is even worse. So the uh, social and economic rights for so many people in the world is even worse, especially in our, in our region. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, just to remember, uh, the, the Americas is the most unequal region in the world. So right now, the problem of the social and economic rights due to the inequality is even worse in the Americas. And finally, and very important because it's our topic today, the access to justice. Access to justice during the pandemic uh, is limited, unfortunately limited. Uh, so many courts are closed, so many trials are suspended, even though the domestic and regional justice is needed even more than ever now because of the, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we need more protection for, for the human rights and in general, any, any right. Okay, so we can, we can go to the next slide. So what, what can we do with that situation? What can we do with this uh, sudden uh, pandemic situation with uh, so many limits of all the human rights? Uh, suddenly, so many new public policies and government decisions are needed uh, to face the pandemic. But those public policies and government decisions need guidelines and need limits. And due to that, the Inter-American System of Human Rights has been responding uh, through the Inter-American Commission and through the Inter-American Court in order to give guidelines and limits uh, uh, to those uh, government and state actions in order to prevent, monitor, and protect human rights during the pandemic. Uh, this response of the Inter-American System of Human Rights, I think, has been effective and quick. And the idea today is to show more or less the main ideas of the internet, uh, what is doing the Inter-American System of Human Rights in order to response to the to the pandemic. Uh, the inter-American system is important also to say is acting to guarantee access to justice for the human rights protection during the pandemic with a, an special and especially important. So the uh, access to justice is really and especially important for the inter-American system of human rights 
during the pandemic situation. Okay, so next, next slide. So what is doing the inter-American system and what is happening in the inter-American system? As I said before, both institutions, both inter-American main institutions, the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court are acting, trying to, to respond to the problem. In the case of the Inter-American Commission, uh, in uh, April 10, uh, they approved the resolution, the resolution number one, 2020, titled Pandemic and the Human Rights in the America. Uh, the idea and the main goal of the resolution is to give guidelines for the prevention, monitoring, and protection of human rights in the region during the COVID-19 the COVID pandemic. And it is a very complete and um, very specific resolution, I think. It includes 85 recommendations to the member states uh, that has both negative obligation and positive obligation that the state should comply and also the public policies should comply to respect uh, and protect human rights during the pandemic. The state, for example, I, I just want to uh, to, to show and share with you some of that guideline because there are so many, 85. But in summary, we can say that uh, they include the, the following. First, uh, for the Inter-American Commission, the state should adopt immediately all the measures that are appropriate to protect the right to life, right to health, and personal integrity of people in their jurisdiction against the pandemic risk. Second, uh, they should adopt immediately a human rights approach in, in any state strategy, policy, or measure aimed at confronting the COVID-19 pandemic. So second one, I think is really important. Any approach to the pandemic should be from the perspective of the human rights. So it's not, possi it's not poss possible to limit the rights and the freedoms just because of the pandemic. This is very important to have the perspective of the human rights in mind. Third one uh, is to adopt immediately a human rights approach, as I said before, in any state strategy, policy, or measure aimed at confronting the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, to adopt measures and practice described there to guarantee any economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights all the 85 recommendations is, are regarding each one of the economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, how they should be protected during the pandemic. And uh, very important, uh, the Inter-American Commission insisted that the state should avoid restrictive actions regarding fundamental freedoms. So the state of emergency that should be declared because of the pandemic should always be under the rule of law and the separation and mutual control of powers. And I think that there is really important the access to justice has the ultimate guarantee of the protection of the rights. So the access to justice has a very first goal and is to protect and control any state action uh, regarding emergency and regarding a state of alarm. So if the state uh, action is out of the rule of law, access to justice should be there and control the excess of power and excess of limit of the freedom and civil rights. And finally, what is the traditional standard of the inter-American system, and is really important uh, now again, is to give special attention to the groups in a particular situation of vulnerability during the pandemic. Uh, uh, traditionally, the uh, inter-American system has considered in different contexts the elderly people, women, indigenous people, refugees, immigrants, people with disabilities, uh, kids and adolescents as people in a special situation of vulnerability. Probably now they are uh, in a special and particular vulnerability due to the uh, social and economic condition. So they are even more vulnerable to the pandemic. So probably they need an special protection and the state should give, should provide that, that protection. 
Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Wonderful. So uh, the same resolution and other, uh, I mean, uh, a part of the resolution number one, 2020, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has created a special unit uh, named uh, SACROI, SACROI by the Spanish acronym that means more or less rapid are an integrated response coordination unit uh, with the goal of uh, to strengthen the institutional capacity and give effective prevention, monitoring, support, and protection of human rights during the pandemic. Uh, the SACROI is actively uh, monitoring the protection of human rights all the time and gives an extra guarantees to the access to justice from the regional perspective through petitions and precautionary measures uh, in the Inter-American Commission. So I think the, the SACRO is, is giving a special protection and a special uh, guarantee to the human rights during the pandemic, uh, receiving precautionary measures all the time. Okay, so so we can go to the to the next slide. Okay, and what is going? What is happening with the Inter-American Court? We already know what is what is doing the Inter-American Commission, the special measures, and the creation of the Sacroi. And at the same time, the Inter-American Court is acting and is responding to the pandemic. The Inter-American Court uh, approved the declaration number one, 2020, in April 10. Uh, the title of the declaration is COVID-19 and human rights. The problems and challenges must be approached uh, with a human rights perspective and respecting international obligation. And I think it's very important, I have to say, uh, both the declaration and re the resolution, because both try to summarize, summarize all the obligations that already exist in the inter-American system, the obligations that are in the American Convention of Human Rights, in other legal uh, instruments of the inter-American system, and, the, of, and, and of course, in the inter-American standard. So it, it is not new obligation. Are the same obligation, but put all together, trying to remember to the state that they should comply that standards during the pandemic. The Inter-American Court, uh, including the, in the declaration that the member state uh, should approach the pandemic from the rule of law, the American Convention of Human Rights, other inter-American legal instrument, I mean, all the conventions that are signed and ratified by the member states in the inter-American system, the Inter-American Court's uh, jurisprudence, uh, always from a human rights perspective, and uh, complying with the international and regional cooperation, which is really, really important to the international and regional, regional cooperation to uh, fight against the pandemic. And three main, there are so many others uh, points in the declaration, but probably three very important are first, freedom and human rights restrictions are exceptional. And I think this is a very important word, are exceptional and only possible under the rule of law and the separation of power. So restrictions should be under the rule of law and only in exceptional uh, or particular circumstances, no more than it is needed to, to be done. Second one, any police force and punishment should be reasonable and proportional, respecting the right to life, personal liberty, freedom of speech, and personal integrity. So maybe if we see between lines, we can see how the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is highlighting first the Inter-American standards, second, the constitutional standards, the respect of the rule of law, the respect of the separation of power, and third, probably the administrative law standards. So the police force and the administrative state should act under the main principles of the administrative law, how is the reasonable uh, reasonability and proportionality 
of the of the action of the state. So it's trying to remember all the framework uh, that is under the rule of law in a domestic and in a regional perspective. Finally, for the Inter-American Court, it's really important to the protection and guarantee of the social, economic, and cultural rights that should be provided even with positive measures, especially, again, to people uh, who are in a vulnerable situation, uh, special importance to the right to health, right to education, economic freedom, and labor rights are very, really important also to the, uh, in, the, in the court declaration. Okay, so next, next slide. And what about access to justice? What is saying the Inter-American Court of Human Rights about access to justice during the COVID-19 pandemic? The Inter-American Court is really, really expressly, uh, I think, when it said that it is essential to guarantee access to justice and complaint mechanism during the pandemic. So uh, I think we, we, we can, have different perspective uh, for that declaration. First, uh, access to justice is essential from a national and a regional perspective. It's essential in a domestic level, but it's also essential in the regional or inter-American level. Second, access to justice is essential to control the conventionality and constitutionality of the emergency measures all the time. So any emergency measure that is taken by the state should be controlled or could be controlled uh, by the constitutional justice or the inter-American justice to see the conventionality and con constitutional control. Third, uh, access to justice is really important to control the government and police excess of power. And then we have again in front of the administrative law and the administrative justice that should be in front of the excess of power during the pandemic. And finally, access to justice is essential to demand protection and provision of human rights uh, during the pandemic, as I said before, all the, all the rights, civil rights, political rights, or to provide a better guarantee to the social and economic and economic rights. Okay, so, okay, so just conclusion, I promise it's only three more minutes and I'm, I, I am done. Uh, I think we have conclusions in two orders of ideas. Uh, in a general perspective regarding all the human rights and then in a particular perspective regarding access to justice. In a general perspective, uh, I think we can uh, affirm that COVID-19 pandemic is a difficult challenge for the guarantee and protection of human rights, it's no doubt. Second, the pandemic situation should be approached from a human rights perspective all the time. This is really, really important, approach from a human rights perspective. Third, the states cannot exercise abusive powers to restrict freedoms and human rights due to a state of emergency and alarm. A state of emergency cannot be, uh, cannot justify and even more control over freedoms uh, of the citizens during because of the pandemic. For any human rights restriction during the pandemic should be under the rule of law. It means domestic law and the inter-American law in, in the case of the of the, of, a, or of a region no, of, the, of the Americas. Uh, five, the state should reinforce positive measures to provide a better guarantee to the social, economic, cultural, and environmental rights during the pandemic. And finally, it's important to take into account the groups in a particular situation of vulnerability that needs a special attention during the pandemic. Uh, it's the inter intersectionality perspective of the inter-American system. And probably they need different attention, probably the refugees attention is different than the indigenous people and is different from the disability uh, people during the pandemic. So each one of them has a, their own reality, uh, but should be attended by the state and should be attended by the inter-American system of human rights. Okay, so next slide. 
Okay, and from a particular perspective of the access to justice, I think we can conclude first that the ultimate guarantee for human rights is access to justice in both in a domestic and a regional perspective, in a national and an inter-American perspective. And we have to remember always that access to justice is per se a human right that cannot be suspended or restricted never due to the pandemic situation. Uh, social uh, distances, distancing measures and closure of public office activities cannot include a suspension of access to justice. Probably we need to switch to online petition systems uh, in order to maintain the, the access to justice in every level and in, in every area of the judiciary, but it's needed to have a way to receive all the petitions that are needed, needed during the pandemic. And finally, uh, I think that preventive and precautionary measures are really important and have a special significance during the pandemic, they are probably the best way to guarantee access to justice and to prevent irreparable damage, not only uh, of the right to health, but, uh, but also to any other human right and any other right in general during this time. And uh, yeah, the next, last one, yeah, just to say thank you. Thank you, Brazil, for this wonderful, amazing image that you bring to the whole world uh, during the pandemic. And uh, especially thank you, Pernambuco, for having me today and for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, I, I I was listening your presentation, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, it was very clear, uh, some informative. Thank you very much. Uh, this subject is a little bit closer to my research work. Uh, I, I like a lot of this this subject. I think there are a, a, a big problem in the inter-American human rights system, uh, a problem of strength. Uh, there are some reasons, but I, I, I can highlight the absence of the right to petition directly in the court. Uh, this is a, a big limit. I, I, I think then that, that uh, the commission is not enough. The, the, the dialogue with commission is not enough. And I, I think that's a, a problem of access to justice. Uh, of course, the non-participation of the United States and the Canada in full system is another uh, relevant limit. They, they, they are... Uh, under the uh, uh, court, uh, they, they uh, don't participate of the court. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to highlight that the, the jurisprudence of the system is uh, excessively centered uh, in traditional rights, uh, maybe uh, rights from uh, early constitutionalism, uh, like freedom of speech, religious freedom, life, physical integrity, to, to use uh, American terminology, uh, civil rights, civil rights, uh, or even minorities' rights. Uh, the, the present experience may reveal the need for stronger action in the social rights. I, I, I believe in multilateralism. Uh, I, I could not see the guarantee of human rights as a task for the national state alone. Uh, I, I do recognize that we are in the time of the uh, 
uh, international institutions are uh, decreasing the uh, the, the importance. I I, I I will explain more. Uh, I I uh, I think that we we need more action in international organizations, but uh, in national political debate, the image of the international organization uh, is in decay. Unfortunately, I I think uh, Susan. The blame can be placed in part on the international policy of no American government. Sorry, <laughs> the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, are moments to discredit by the United Nations. Uh, uh, these were two big mistakes. Uh, in addition, in, in many countries, there are political groups that present international organizations as threats to national interests. Nowadays, in, in this pandemic, there are many attacks on the image of the World Health Organization, which is presented by some politicians as an instrument of China. There are several conspiracy theories involving international organizations. That's a common fake news subject. Then I will uh, ask you only one question. Uh, it, it's one question, but it's not an easy question, okay? Uh, do you believe that the inter-American human rights system will tend to become stronger after this pandemic? In other words, what is the outlook for the system in a post-pandemic scenario? Will straightening of international organization be a good legacy from this time of pandemic? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Gustavo, so much for your comments and your question. Uh, great question. Before uh, to answer your question, just briefly regarding your comment, I totally agree with you. I, I think that the, we, there are so many things that should be uh, thought in the inter-American system regarding the access to justice. What, uh, uni universality is still a big problem in the inter-American system. So there is not a universal access to justice in the inter-American system and it should be changed. Second, uh, as you say before, for example, we have the United States and we, we have Canada that are members of the OAS, uh, but they are but they didn't ratify uh, the American Convention of F Human Rights, and there is a problem of all uh, again with uh, of universality. If we don't have a system where every country in the region is part of the system, we don't have a uni universality protection of the human rights. And even with the countries that already ratify the American Convention, uh, not all the countries ratify also all the treaties. There are so many countries that ratified the American Convention but didn't sign so many other treaties. Belén do Pará, for example, or uh, the Convention Against Torture or Convention Against Discrimination. So we have different levels of uh, different levels of comply of the states the, uh, within the American, uh, the inter-American system, and this is not good. At the end, only a few countries, if we see a big pictures, only a few countries ratified all the conventions and ratified the jurisdiction of the court. I, I don't have the numbers with me right now, but I, uh, I, think, I think it's no more than 20 states that ratify everything. So we don't have a universal a universal system yet. And probably we can link that comment with your question. Maybe the pandemic is a good moment to rethink so many things in the, in the American system of human rights, probably. Um, I believe that the world will not be the same after the pandemic, no? in any area of the life. 
and neither will be with the in the in the human rights protection and in the inter-American system of human rights and access to justice. I think uh, probably the pandemic situation will last for a long time. I hope no, but probably yes. Maybe the social distancing, distancing and economic um, and business opening, maybe in a short time could be relaxed, I hope. Uh, but we will still have so many controls probably and limits to the freedoms, civil rights, and also we will have a weak protection of social and economic rights for a, for a while. So I think it's a good moment for the inter-American system to rethink the access to justice within the system and uh, regarding the domestic level. And uh, things like, for example, uh, journalists, uh, freedom of speech, and especially, as you say before, especially social and economic rights. Now, the inter-American system has advanced in the last years uh, to protect or to, and to give uh, judicial direct protection of the social and economic right, but maybe it's not enough. Okay, right to health, for example, yes, there is a, jurisp also, uh, a jurisprudence that admit the direct protection of the right to health, but maybe there is needed even more, okay? And could we not, not an excuse the uh, economic situation of the countries that uh, cannot afford a good uh, public health system, for, for example, but so many others. So yes, uh, uh, the, the answer to your question is yes, I think the should be uh, the inter-American uh, system of human rights maybe will be different after the pandemic and probably should need to rethink so many so many things within the system the inter the inter-american system and regarding the the national protection of the human rights yeah thank you uh, Sergio I, I think that says we will introduce Susan thank you Okay, can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Great. Oh, just... No, 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 no. <coughs> Sergio? Now? Now can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, a lot of stuff here. Headset, my, my, my smartphone and everything. Daniela, <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. It was great. And you helped the translator so much. You, you didn't speak speed up too much and every once in a while you gave a pause that's great like i speak in on in terms of all translators it's a lot easier when the speaker not only knows the subject very well but he realizes that there's someone behind trying to interpret what they're saying so it's great really 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 interesting i didn't know all those details i had some idea of the work of the of the, the the, the, the system of protection of human rights, the inter-American system, but not all those details. And I love the way that they made those guidelines uh, directed to, to, to the countries to try not only to protect the, the type of human rights we, which we're accustomed to talk of uh, every day, but the, the ideal of access to justice, which is so, so important. Thank you so very much. Eu agradeci, então, a Daniela pela apresentação, isso também pelo fato de ela ter falado sem correr tanto, com algumas pausas, que acaba ajudando um pouco na tradução. Muito bem. Vamos, então, agora... O Daniela ainda vai falar mais adiante, certo? Vai, vai falar mais adiante, mas agora nós vamos ter nossa segunda é, expositora, né? A Susan Simon Kang. Eu vou falar agora um pouco em português, depois eu volto a falar em, em inglês. Né? A Susan, como eu mencionei antes, é professora do Boston College, é realmente né, amada por milhares e milhares de brasileiros, é, é alguém, então, que, que tem uma simpatia sem igual, assim, eu, 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 no primeiro minuto que eu conheci a Suzy, eu digo, que, que pessoa simpática, que pessoa tão melhor da minha, né? realmente é né, encantadora, e vejam o que ela fez, vejam o que ela fez hoje, eu vou falar depois em inglês, mas eu acho que ela vai entender também agora, ela, ela fala português, fala ita, italiano, espanhol, né, né, é, é, várias línguas. Né? Hoje é o aniversário da professora Susan. E quando nós fizemos o convite, então ela sabia, ela não mencionou, que ela não queria que nós mudássemos a data só por causa dela, mas aí, então, quando ela é, é, me informou depois que era o aniversário dela, mas Susan, logo no seu aniversário, ela, aí ela disse, não existe 
uma forma melhor de eu passar o meu aniversário, que não é menor para poder falar com meus amados amigos brasileiros e conhecer novos amigos. Então, esse é o tipo de pessoa que a Susan né, é, é. é a né, que domina e que né, quer compartilhar os seus conhecimentos. E nós estamos, estamos muito honrados com a participação. Eu vou falar, então, em inglês, depois vou passar a, a palavra para ela, e aí eu retorno para a minha tradução, ok? Ok, eu estou falando em português agora, vou falar em inglês de novo. Eu agradeço a Daniela por sua brilhante lecture, foi maravilhoso. Eu amo isso, eu amo estudar acesso à justiça e... In that system is, is really, really interesting. And I was just introducing you, birthday girl Susan. I just <laughs> told all the all Brazilians that today is your birthday, and it was just re remarkable because uh, 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 when I when you told me that it was your birthday, and I was like, but on your birthday, participate in a webinar, you should be with your family. And you, you said, oh, but I think there's no better way for me to celebrate my birthday than celebrate it in a webinar, being able to, uh, to share my experience and be able to talk to all my Brazilian friends, who aren't only friends, Susan, they're your fans. I mean, you have fans. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking Team Susan Kang here in, in Brazil, okay? Oh. That's, that's really how it is. It's a, we're very honored and a great, great uh, uh, honor for, to have you here in uh, this webinar. So I am going to leave uh, 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 to translate again, so you give me about 30 seconds, and then you can go ahead and, and, and you can start speaking English to, to introduce, okay? And if, if anything happens, Gustavo will help me out, who spoke some very good English. He was, he was telling me he's a little bit afraid. Very, very much better than he told me. You fooled me, Gustavo. You fooled me. You're a lot better than you, than you gave up. Okay? <laughs> okay? I'm going to mute myself, and I'll go for the translation. Okay. Muito obrigada, muito obrigado a, a todo a todos os brasileiros que estão uh, com, comigo esta esta dia muito muito especial para mim eh, para participar em esta convocatória com o ilustro grupo de, de participantes com o excelente juiz Sérgio Teixeira e professor Gustavo Feira Santos. E estou tão feliz para estar aqui hoje. Eu gostaria de agradecer à liderança da Escola Judicial de Desembargador Carvalho e, e Valença e os coordenadores Juliana e Badini. Muito obrigada a você e pela a, a Unicap eh, de Pernambuco também muito obrigado pela, pela por lhe invito eh, para a oportunidade de falar hoje. É realmente uma grande honra para mim para, para participar uh, hoje com você. Eu não sei se o se, é, Sérgio tem um pouco de tempo livre, mentre que eu falo o meu um pouco péssimo português, mas espero que ele me ajude a corrigir é, o, meu <risos> o meu português. É muito importante para mim para continuar a praticar. Né? É super importante, é, espero que você é, é, tenha um pouco de paciência por, comigo quando eu continuo a, a provar a falar no, no português. Eu uh, uh, hoje falo do acesso à justiça nos Estados Unidos da América. E a pergunta que faz o Gustavo, uh, professor Gustavo, era exatamente o problema inicial que temos é, na vida estadunidense cotidiana a hoje, é o problema de anos e anos, né? 100 anos, 200 anos de concentrar-nos sobre uh, uh, de la luta de, de direitos civis, é, mas uh, de ter medo de falar de direitos sociais ou direitos econômicos. Muitas pessoas... Um, I'm falecido, they died fighting for economic rights um, e nos Estados Unidos. Não é um sujeito que é muito apressado no ultracapitalismo que temos na vida da América do Norte. E nesse momento estamos vivendo realmente uma, uma situação muito dura, muito difícil, e o problema que é o acesso à justiça pela pessoa regular, a pessoa do público, é, é, contra, contra, é, é in contradiction com o acesso privilegiado de pessoas que são amigos e 
políticamente atacados a, o conectados con el, ex, el poder ejecutivo en ese momento. Yo puedo dar por mes, con el ejemplo eh, que en ese momento, mientras que hablamos, el procurador general de los Estados Unidos Federal va a terminar el caso contra Michael Flynn, que era el capo de seguridad que estaba eh, eh, cooperando con uh, la Rusia eh, contra, contra, eh, contra eh, la partida democrática durante la última elección. Imaginamos en este periodo que si uno puede tener acceso a la justicia, si es un amigo del presidente, pero no puede tener acceso a la justicia, una persona pobre. Es, una, es exactamente la crisis que estamos viviendo en este momento. Ayer noche, el profesor Barroso habló de no solo una crisis de un pandémico, pero muchas crisis, crisis de desigualdad, crisis de, de, de salud um, general por, la, por el público americano, eh, crisis de inmigración. Eh, eh, tenemos una trauma en la parte norteamericana en ese momento, Uh, un público que interesa mucho eh, la, la libertad y la, uh, la vista de los Estados Unidos como una democracia que se interesa y no que es a, 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 a abierta, no es no es not closed to the world. Pero como dice Gustavo, mu muchas cosas iniciando en la nuestra historia están limitando las posibilidades. Eh, por ejemplo, la, 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 el, fato, el dato que no participamos en la Corte Interamericana, que es imposible, ¿no? No, es, debe, debe, es una cosa que se, de, se debe evolucionar, se debe cambiar, porque en no un país es afuera la ley. Ayer noche el profesor Barroso dice no existe nada afuera la ley. Eh, y hablamos un poco cómo hemos iniciado, cómo partimos de este problema. Eh, con la próxima slide, por favor, si posamos. En eh, los Estados Unidos, la primera vez que hablamos de acceso a la justicia era durante el periodo de 1963. Como usted sabe, en el sistema estadounidense apoyamos mucho sobre los casos y no solo estatus uh, legislativos. El, el caso muy famoso por, por los Estados Unidos de América era Gideon V. Wainwright. En ese caso, el señor Gideon no tenía, uh, no había dinero, era pobre, persona que no podría obtener eh, eh, representación de un abogado. Eh, esta expresión que tengo acá, within our own borders, particularly as we approach the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, guaranteeing the right to counsel for indigent criminal defendants, the United States also pledges to take steps to improve access to justice for those who cannot afford representation. Es difícil imaginar, pero esta expresión era de la prima del primo procurador general, Gen, uh, Eric Holder, de la administración del presidente Obama, la, la persona que después Michael Flynn, se puede imaginar, continúa la representación de los Estados Unidos. Esa cosa es, por inicio, increíble. Pero debemos también hablar uh, de de la, um, el vacuo o lo, what is not here, what is not written here. So if you see, this statement was made for the United Nations General Assembly a uh, one year before the 50th anniversary. And so when the United States referred to various rights um, that they were asked to um, speak about, When it came time to speak about access to justice, the conversation was limited to Gideon V. Wainwright. When I say limited, you will see that it says the United States pledges, promete de tomar medidas para mejorar que el pobre puede uh, pagar representación. 
pledges to take steps, ma non significa que garantice eh, la acceso a justicia. Eso es una expresión un poco de más en mi punto de vista limitado. El limitado a través de Gideon V. Rain, Wainwright, la administración de Obama podría hablar de una mucho más profunda expresión de acceso a justicia, pero eh, era muy conservativo en ese, en ese caso. Eh, I think that we find ourselves now wishing that we asked for more or that we were more forceful about our commitment to access to justice. As Professor Daniela said, access to justice is not only for the person that's poor because that looks at a capitalist model. It also should refer to access to justice for general health and general welfare and education and for those who are limited in their disabilities. Um, so this concept still revolves around a capitalist model and it needs to disengage from a capitalist model in order for it to be truly fair and, and truly accessible to everyone in the society that deserves it. Um, Como explico acá, pero el Gideon V. Rainwright um, establishes que la sexta y la en the 14th amendas de la Constitución Americana del Norte um, es eh, eh, la base del caso de la decisión del de juiz, eh, de, de, de los ministros. The right to counsel in casos criminales, no en casos civiles, casos solo criminales garantida. Es do proceso muy interesante, pero ser aplicado a todos los estados. Y você notando en ese momento de pandemia una lucha muy importante de la parte federal y e la parte estadual. En e la parte federal, en este momento, tenemos un poder ejecutivo que no se interesado a utilizar el poder por un bono común. Está interesado a solo para, para las empresas y no para el público en general. Um, la, el próximo slide, por favor. Ok, ¿Cómo, ¿cuáles son los instrumentos para tratar acceso a justicia? Al, ahora, al, um, si el caso de los, la Corte Suprema y la Administración Presidencial de los Estados Unidos no puedo hablar de una gran amplia um, aplicación de derechos y de acceso a justicia. ¿Cuáles son los instrumentos en particulares que nosotros podemos utilizar para garantizar um, eh, los derechos a, a los pesados? En mi punto de vista, son tres cosas muy importantes. La independencia judicial, la eficiencia judicial, es la sociedad civil. Próximo slide, por favor. E, ¿Cuáles son los puntos clave? El punto clave fue por la, por la independencia judicial. Son, en mi meu, meu, meu punto de vista, nominaciones a lo largo de la vida contra la votación de posiciones judiciales. En los Estados Unidos es posible que en cada, en, en ciertos estados, es posible votar por un juez. Eso es muy complicado y muy problemático. Para que imaginamos que una persona eh, es necesario va like look to be voted and ask for favors for people so that they can become judges. En el estado de Massachusetts tenemos solamente nóminas a lo largo de la vida o a lo largo del periodo, eh, al menos. Eh, pero en otros estados, como el estado de Michigan y otros estados, un juez eh, has to act like a politician. Es eh, súper, súper problemático en el meu punto de vista. Segunda cosa, el proceso de indicación y e aprobación del Senado. Y cuando la Corte Suprema y nuestros ministros son 
eh, nominados y son votados, es muy importante que el proceso no senado no es políticamente eh, limitada. Pero eh, en los últimos años, um, esta, um, the situation has become very extreme with the Senate being very highly politicized. Uh, la terza cosa que es muy nueva, porque, porque no ha, es una, una cosa que no ocurre eh, muchas veces en la historia norteamericana, pero ahora, en, en el año pasado, era muy importante que la presencia del presidente ministro de la Corte Suprema en el proceso de impeachment, uh, de, de, en, en el ejemplo de President Trump. Muchas personas, muchos abogados, juristas, falaban de la situación donde la, el Congreso, la Casa de Diputados y el Senado, completamente politizados, que a la fin con el, el, el presidente ministro de la Corte Suprema en presencia, um, abaixaba mucho la, la importancia de la Corte Suprema. Because many people saw a very politicized um, process where everybody knew what the result was going to be, and it undermined the legitimacy and integrity of the court to force the chief justice to be present. But that is the rule. Those are the rules. So this um, really undermines the independence of the judiciary to be placed in such a politicized environment. Uh, el próximo slide, por favor. Eh, falamos de otros puntos chave, eficiencia judicial. Yo sabo que muchos de ustedes eh, tienen muchas cosas en común con nuestros jueces norteamericanos. El problema de números de casos, por ejemplo, eh, problemas de la, um, the management of cases, case management, Um, la largo periodo de un caso que no, no se termina por año y años. Tenemos todos nosotros los mismos problemas. Ma, tenemos uh, des elementos en la parte norteamericana que les ayuda un poco con la eficiencia. Y uno de esos es eh, el estar en decesis y precedentes judiciales. Uh, porque termina discusiones, termina conflictos cuando podemos ver en el pasado decisiones que pueden nos ayudar y que, que, que tenemos una continuación y homogeneación de resultado que es mucho más eficaz y mucho más eh, justo, ¿no? eh, que aplica a todas las personas de la misma manera. Eh, la segunda uh, cosa es de tener un, un mandado abogatorio eh, que es la parte de la Corte de Apelo de segunda instancia, la, la posibilidad de hacer la reclamación, pero la última Corte Suprema no es absolutamente eh, obligado a, a oír todos los casos, solo casos que son interesados a, a ministros. Segunda cosa son uh, una cultura de resolución de conflictos consensual antes del nivel de las primeras instancias, en la producción anticipada de pruebas. Eh, en, en ese caso, utilizando eh, arbitraje o mediación, pero también la, la comprensión de los casos de evidencia que es eh, anticipada, que, que, con, que se convence a las partes de resolver antes de ir a corte, antes de utilizar uh, los uh, útiles judiciarios. Eh, of course, arbitraje mediación. Y yo sé que en el, en el Brasil usted tiene muchos avanzados eh, um, medidas para resolver uh, conflictos a través de mediación, mediación por internet, uh, mediación y arbitraje a larga distancia. Ahora, en el tiempo de pandemia, imagino que utilizamos nosotros en no, no Norteamérica mucho más también con ustedes. 
E, finalmente, o gerenciamento de casos, como falado, de custos e abusos de sistema pela partida, pela partes, pelas duas partes eh, do caso. E then to go to, thank you, o último ponto chave são de la, lo que temos nós, o público, de atores não, govern, não, não governamentais, que são um, de la nossa parte, similar de, la, de los uh, escolas magistrados, são a American Bar Association, que é la, uma organização civil de advogados mais grande no todo o mundo e tem uma possibilidade de passar resoluções que possam falar de coisas, possam confrontar problemas a acesso à justiça, mais fortemente, sem problema de lobbying, sem problema de política ou menos problema de política, e são muito, é uma, um órgão muito importante nos Estados Unidos. E que fala, every once in a while, de problemas internacionais também. E segunda possibilidade, na né, parte, la parte não governamental, são la, os NGOs ou ONGs que trabalham em, com o público a nível de grassroots que são muito, muito importantes. Muito importantes porque têm o um, trust del, del público, because they are not affiliated and they are independent. E hoje temos la, la, o invito da Unicap, e todos os universitários são muito importantes eh, para avançar eh, acesso à justiça, especialmente através de clínicas, programas de clínicas, eh, partes de câmaras universitárias. Eh, nos Estados Unidos, temos, eh, imagino também no Brasil, eh, o, o novo ideia de pop-up clínicas, são clínicas móveis que, que vão no país eh, a ajudar a gente diretamente no seu na vilage, na cidade, e les ajuda sem a necessidade de, de ir, de la gente que necessita ir à a, a cidade, pagar transporte, pagar comida, a, a loja a, é demasiado custoso, nós vamos a, ao público. E também in situ, em nossa clínica, é a é la, é la, la nossa a professora Urosa é a diretora da Clínica de Direitos Humanos Interamericanos e Internacionais. Ela ajuda uh, com as peticiones de amigos curie na Corte Interamericana e las, em outras cortes eh, nos Estados Unidos também. E, e lo fazemos in situ a Boston, a Boston College, eh, com a investigação... Eh, e es, é, é com os estudantes de um mestre e também de pregrado. E, ao fim, uma coisa muito interessante que nosso professor Daniel Farman fala muito, está investigando muito, se, se fala da eh, advocacia de resistência, que coisa significa. Eh, você sabe que durante o, o, a primeira semana da de de administração de Trump, que é a clausura de, de aeroportos, aeroportos por pessoas de origens eh, do Médio Oriente. E muitos advogados, eh, se, they went to the airport, sitting on the floor of the airport with computers, typing motions, and, take, and taking cases right physically on the ground, literally in the airports all over the United States and then running to the courthouses to deliver petitions so that people could be released and brought to the United States, allowed to basically walk through the door and sospirare l'aria di libertà. And um, this is a form of advocacy resistance que diferente de la historica civil disobedience de Dr. Martin Luther King Jr pero têm uma mesma coração, uma mesma ideia, que de estar junto com o público, estar com a gente, estar vivendo o conflito vivo, em vivo, um advogado, 
que tenemos el privilegio de la nuestra instrucción, la nuestra, uh, la nuestra uh, carrera, pero lo debemos utilizar por medidas, por el buen público. Eh, eso es una, una posibilidad que tenemos y por eso yo tengo mucho más, uh, how do I say, hope, tengo esperanza que la nueva generación está mirando, está prestando atención de lo que hacemos ahora. Eh, yo, yo, I won't say too much more because I will wait for Professor Ferreira Santos to ask me about the future, but I have some ideas about what might happen next. Eh, un próximo slide, por favor. Ahora, los, la, la Corte, cosa fa, la Corte en ese momento, en el, en la, la su respuesta pandémica, los tribunales tienen um, a través de, de working group nacional, pero nacionales de estaduales, un grupo eh, organizado de todos los estados en los Estados Unidos que Uh, un sitio en el internet que explica en cada, en cada estado cuáles son las limitaciones, cuáles son lo, las reglas ahora en la corte y todos los links, você notando en orden alfabético, Arizona, Arkansas, Guam, etc. Próximo slide, por favor. Y próximo slide. Mi, mucho obrigado. Esta es la conferencia nacional de tribunales estaduales. En la parte de Massachusetts, eh, el link está allá, el link que explica, que, uh, lo, uh, que explica los atrasos o ris, uh, restricciones ordenados en todo el estado, y los, uh, los registrados, uh, los procedimientos, presencias, fino a hasta el primo de junio. El suspenso de juramentos de jurías se extiende hasta el primo de julio. Eh, localmente, eh, órdenes locales son anticipados por órdenes estaduales para, para organizar el Estado. Y cada Estado tiene más o menos una, eh, una explicación así. Por ejemplo, un abogado en el Estado de Massachusetts que tiene un caso en New York o puedo ver a ese sitio a saber cuáles son los límites de restricciones de, de, de días y de, de órdenes. Y los órdenes, por ejemplo, los, un orden que terminó o se era cerrado en un momento, en un momento, en la mitad de un caso, eh, no continúa. Está exactamente en ese momento, si uno uh, tiene siete días, los siete días comienzan otra vez el primo de julio. Eh, te, no, no se pierden los días necesarios por el, por el caso. And uh, the next slide, please. Then, um, la próxima slide, por favor. So, ¿cuáles son los observaciones? Yo, antes de hoy, yo falo con un juez eh, pensionado un fiscal eh, que está uh, trabajando ahora es una abogada en la parte de la inmigración. Eh, eso son un sumario de uh, lo, el consejo que me dieron ellos durante este periodo. El eh, próximo slide, please, porque es eh, en, en portugués. Lidando con un movimiento de emergencia, esas son las oportunidades y desafíos. En este momento, las oportunidades existen a considerar la solicitación de liberación de condiciones inseguras de salud o serios problemas familiares fuera de la prisión. So, um, yo conozco a un fiscal que ahora tiene toda la mañana, toda la mañana por horas, a discutir a, 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 a peticiones de personas en este momento en prisión que están... Uh, asking, están preguntando por la liberación, por muchos casos, por muchas razones. Y él está liberando mucha gente. Mucha gente porque las condiciones no prisión son, no son salud, de buena salud. Mucha gente eh, tiene un riesgo muy alto uh, por la transmisión del COVID. Y también su familia afuera del prisión tiene mucho miedo por... Eh, 
eh, porque viven en casos uh, muy uh, altos riesgosos, eh, por ejemplo, en um, edificios con tan, mucha, mucha gente que viven muy uh, uh, very close to each other um, and very and poorer people. So we have some very good work happening with the prosecution here in the locality. E están respondiendo los, lo, la respuesta a procedimientos de emergencias en caso, en casa, en casa solo usando teleconferencia. Semplice, una cosa, no Zoom, porque el Estado no puede pagar por un gran, de gran suscripción, uh, but, the, but the people are taking telephone calls from judges and from the public and um, having proceedings in their houses by telephone. Um, ¿Cuáles son uh, los desafíos? Los desafíos son grandes, los desafíos son una multitud en, en ese momento. Uh, por ejemplo, eh, eh, existen muchos atrasos en el tiempo de procesamiento para casos regulares, casos de emergencias se están moviendo pero en, en el estado de Massachusetts, pero casos regulares es muy uh, lento, muy, muy lento. Um, problema en casa, problema de ambientes familiares domésticos inseguros, si la persona viene liberada y revuelve a casa, pero la situación de la casa, que están fingados en casa, pero ¿qué significa cuando no es, no es seguro en su casa propio? ¿A dónde se, se puede escapar? Where do you go um, if you are not safe in your own home? So there are constant balance, checks and balances and um, effects like the domino crisis that we are talking about where we fix one problem, but three more problems become, come to our attention um, and, and, become, and become difficult. Uh, the other, um, el otro era de la abogada Janete Moreno, eh, que es de origen mexicana, eh, que ayuda mucho a la gente sobre casos de migraciones. Eh, ella uh, me, me habló de problema de cuando uno habla en español um, eh, con, su, con su cliente, es muy difícil traducir eh, todo el proceso. Es muy más fácil hacerlo en persona para explicar eh, todo el sistema, un sistema completamente de, diferente de common law, del sistema civil en otros países. Eso es, es, bastante, es bastante complicado y, y también... La, la cultura latinoamericana que nos tenemos la eh, necesario eh, estar juntos eh, trabajar juntos es muy difícil cuando estás separado de tu la única persona que te ayuda que se pueda ayudar eh, ella también habla de cambiamiento de reglamento en el inmigración que el sistema federal no está hablando con el sistema estadual y los abogados son los últimos a ser informados. Y, y, so they are, es un periodo muy estresante por un abogado que, que no sabe si el federal es abierto, no es abierto, está poniendo documento, está aceptando documento. Los uh, documentos electrónicos, eh, sí, es posible, mas el cliente es pobre y no tiene uh, fax machine o no tiene papeles para, para señalar o se, se necesita utilizar la posta tradicional. Eh, perden, perden mucho tiempo a, a de esperanza con sus casos de, de asilio y otros problemas muy duros por la vida de los inmigrantes. Eh, el, el, the next slide, please. El, quiero decir solo que yo soy mucho, tengo mucha esperanza, no obstante lo que he indicado en esa presentación, pero tengo mucho más esperanza que he indicado ahora y estoy, estoy siempre disponible a compartir razones en que yo tengo esperanza. Muchas gracias. 
Thank you, Susan. Do you prefer in English or Portuguese? I think the English question is better, and then I'll try to answer in uh, I need okay, to okay. In English if it gets complicated. Okay. One more time. Uh, thank you for working in, in your birthday. <laughs> I, I, I think that it's not the ideal party, but uh, we, we, we are happy to share with you this moment. Uh, the subject, the access to justice, is a complex uh, uh, subject. It allows different ways to be addressed. Uh, you have exposed this complexity by showing that here are many problems to solve. There are many agents, many actors involved. Uh, the fight against uh, COVID-19 demonstrates how important the government is in the safeguarding basic rights. Uh, the market doesn't save us from the virus. I know it's very difficult to debate about high cost social rights in the United States. <laughs> That's the, the, the challenge of the political debate on Medicare for all. Uh, I think that it was the most important theme in democratic primaries. Uh, so it must be difficult to invest tax money to set up a national agency dedicated to uh, providing access to justice. Uh, access to professional support in lawsuit is a specific problem in the uh, subject of access to, to, to justice. The main point is the, the cost of the service. For the most people, the price of legal professional work is not affordable. So the problem has no uh, simple uh, solution. But the problem of access to justice is bigger. When we talk about access to justice, we, we aren't just talking about access to judicial branch. We, we aren't talking about lawsuit, but we are talking about uh, people having self-control of their legal life. Perhaps the main challenge on access to justice is to make people aware of the basic rights. Then I, I have two questions about the future, future. Firstly, do you think the experience of pandemic can change the basis of the American debate on the social rights, especially the a, a, a debate about Medicare for all. The second question, as consequence, if it will be possible to discuss the creation of a federal agency or a state agency specifically dedicated to guarantee access to justice, like other countries, I know that America, you, you explained it, America has uh, uh, in criminal uh, cases, th this support, but uh, uh, the uh, legal life is wider. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th thank you. <laughs> the the question, the question that you just asked, Professor Gustavo, is the most important question facing North America today. I'm going to give this answer in English because I'm going to be reaching back into uh, observations that I have made over the past 20 years in the United States. M many of you know that I was born here in the United States, but my family did not always live in the United States. Um, my father was born in Italy and during the middle of World War II. And much of what I experienced in my growing up was living around refugees from all over the world, seeking for a better America, North America, seeking for an opportunity. Many of these people were seeking um, freedom from persecution. 
but they were also seeking economic liberation. And they were um, at willing to accept a certain laissez-faire attitude about the social structure so long as the immediate problem of economic uh, independence could be addressed because that was their immediate crisis. And while we thought we were gaining foot, solid footing, we were actually losing it footing because we began a process not that far after World War II of deregulating so many businesses and creating such an open market, um, open market, uh, not only of traditional industries like the airline industry, but also markets like securitized mortgage assets. And this un unfettered and unlimited seeking of additional places of capital growth um, gave, made people think that it was okay because everybody got a little bit of it the sort of trickle down idea. But the reality is that because of that, people were not being taught that they had other rights and other aspirations to achieve. And if somebody wanted to express those differences, they were labeled communist or socialist and they were treated like an othering, an enemy. But many of us kids grew up with parents who saw the differences between two systems, some more authoritarian and others more liberal, and said somewhere along the way here in the US, it's not perfect, but it, we have a, a less extreme situation. Well, now we have an extreme situation and we have been building it since the 1980s. So inequality in the United States is now just as extreme as it is anywhere else in the world. As you pointed out, there were decisions made about getting involved in certain international conflicts, which did not have the vote of the Security Council, despite the legal, um, the legal myth that was created with the memorandum that explained why it was okay to torture people with waterboarding or why it was okay to enter Iraq for the second time, when in fact any legal scholar of good faith could see that we were presenting the memos to make the executive branch license to do what it wanted to do, rather than think about the true legality and take the position and give the counsel. Lawyers became lawyers for hire instead of counselors. And access to lawyers became a privilege of the highest level of citizenship instead of something that everyone deserved. So it's you get what you pay for. But what happens if you can't pay for it? Does that make you invisible? And people have been invisible for too long. People have been invisible long enough that they have been drawn into populism on the one hand um, or the parallel, which would be like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, an attempt to rebalance the equation and provide a more equal opportunity for others. I could easily see someone like Elizabeth Warren creating a federal agency or running a federal agency requiring access to justice because she did it already. The Consumer Protection uh, Department for the federal government was created by her and she did it to balance the inequality between the banks and the individual consumers who were made uh, destitute in the last mortgage crisis. Um, in terms of Medicare for all, you saw what happened with Obamacare and how many times it went to the Supreme Court and keep chipping away and chipping away at the strength of that system. Imagine where we would be today without Obamacare. Imagine the health crisis without it. Um, our political leaders 
are trying to rebalance the equation, but we are deluged by false beliefs in false liberties, like the liberty to walk around outside right now without a mask on, or the liberty, uh, because being in home quarantined is somehow the federal government trying to, to imprison you in the house. That's not the martial law. The martial law is when you cannot think freely and you cannot express yourself freely. So I think that we already had some signs that change is coming. And in fact, I see the presence of the current leadership right now as a desperate attempt to hold on to the past, not as a purely self-confident expression of today and tomorrow. I see a fearful public, not a, an empowered public. So those who feel empowered will bring the future forward. And those who are fearful, they are going to, they are going to realize when they're here from others that their attitudes are in, in the extreme. And we sometimes lose sight of that because the leader right now is doing all the talking, a lot of the talking. And there is actually a, not a majority of people who agree. And I think a lot of people are sitting in their houses going, I'm in this situation right now because the president of the United States closed the office of pandemic preparedness that President Obama created. President Obama created an office of pandemic preparedness that was closed in 2018. Imagine if we had an office right now of pandemic preparedness. Instead, the leader of the COVID response is a breeder of labradoodles. Is this reality or reality TV? It is anti-intellectual and it is anarchistic in its anti-institutional uh, perspective. It actually seeks to break down government. It is the antithesis of the rule of law. So we need to get to the next part, which is to fight for what's needed and what's next so that we can begin a serious conversation. I will say one last thing about foreign policy. Um, when President Obama refused to bomb in Syria, he said, um, he told the president, uh, Basar al -Ashaf. He said, I am going to, you cannot, you cannot take this next move to bomb civilians. If you do so, there will be serious repercussions. People interpreted that to mean that the United States would bomb Syria. And the, Obama did not. And it takes more courage to not throw a bomb than it does to push yourself around the world with, with military power. It takes a lot more courage to, to not do the obvious, visually noticeable thing. And I think that the United States was trying to turn a new road by not involving itself, at least not in that fashion internationally. And it was interrupted. And that's what we're looking at right now, a period of interruption which I hope we can recontinue that thread. And I'll stop, I'll stop there. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the old hope that uh, USA changed this year. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Sergio. <laughs> Very emotional, very emotional, Susan. I, I was very touched by, <laughs> by you sharing your experience and and uh, especially the view you had uh, because of your past, because of your family. It's incredibly interesting, a uh, uh, very, very sharp insight on re really what we can consider access to justice. Congratulations, it was wonderful. I was translating. And I do have to admire, stop, just admire what you're saying. Then I have to, oh, I'm still translating. I have to go back. And so I really congratulate <laughs> you. Let me just translate that. 
Eu agradeci, então, agora a Susan pela, pelo seu depoimento emocionante. Você viu que ela compartilhou conosco é, a sua experiência também como filha de imigrante sobre a, o valor do que, que são os direitos sociais, o que são direitos humanos, o ideal de acesso à justiça, com esse olhar e esse reconhecimento. Uma visão muito peculiar, foi fantástica. Eu estava fazendo a tradução, mas estava tão encantado com a respectiva exposição que duas ou três vezes eu tive que parar e aí eu me lembrava que eu ainda estava traduzindo para continuar, então, fazendo a tradução. Realmente fantástico, realmente fantástico. That was really, 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 really great. Well, we still have some time here, and uh, we'll have time for uh, 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 like a final statement from each one of you. And I, I, in order to, to, to go on in that sense, I will uh, 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 give you like, like, uh, like a small guideline or a small idea that if you can construct on. I will start with uh, Daniela, okay? Eu vou falar com eles agora, nós vamos agora para nossos, é, é, nossas conclusões ou razões finais ou pronunciamento final. Eu vou falar para as duas e vou dar uma ideia básica para que elas possam, então, abordar isso. Então, eles vão falar durante agora mais uns 5 ou 10 minutos. E como é um negócio mais curto, eu farei, então, a tradução consecutiva depois. Inicialmente, então, cada um deles vai falar, cada uma delas vai falar, e eu farei a tradução em seguida. This time we'll have, like, a, like a, a, a consecutive translation, so it'll be shorter, you know, about, like, like, three to five minutes each, and then I'll do the translation uh, afterwards. Even though, né, you, like, you both speak so clearly, I'm sure the translation is totally... This, 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 uh, dispensable, you know, and and your Portuguese is really, really great, Susan. Really, really, very, very, very impressed. Also, okay, okay. So I will start uh, uh, now with with Daniela uh, Urosa, okay, and I want to uh, have a little bit of, 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 of an idea of our difficulties here in Brazil right now in terms of uh, access to justice. Uh, 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 our our judiciary has pretty much suspended all uh, attendance in terms of uh, personal attendance because of social distancing. And we are going to start having hearings this month. We, we did actually have hearings, but only virtual ones where there's no uh, 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 argumentation presented. But as of this month, actually as, as about two weeks ago from now, we have had here in Pernambuco uh, 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 some uh some sessions on, on, in our court with uh, uh uh lawyers presenting themselves through zoom or through google meets and presenting their closing arguments which, which was really interesting actually i only participated in this yesterday for the first time it was really really cool really really interesting we had to, we had our, our, our students participating also and, and witnessing this so it was really interesting but we, we are going to start at, at least we, we we have been allowed to start are regular hearings and and a lot of judges are pretty much freaking out they're like thinking like how am i going to do a real hearing but a real hearing through these other uh, technological methods not not with 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 right with with the, with the plaintiff and defendant in front of them and so we're thinking about how we're going to do this like how is it is how is a witness going to be heard How are we going to be able to organize all this, all this logistic? And so many of my colleagues are saying that, well, if any one of the parts just says, no, I don't want to do this. I would rather wait for things to go back to that's normal, whatever normal is going to be. And, and, and so they are sort of resisting. They're very afraid, so they're sort of resisting. And what, what I've been talking to a few of them is this. If you think... Uh, okay, we're coming back a month from now or two months from now or three months from now, the hearing is going to be normal again. That, that'd be great. We have no idea when we're coming back. This could be 2021, uh, second semester maybe. I mean, we, we have actually no idea how we're, we're going to do this. And then you go, come into another problem, which you touched also when you talked about the, 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 the problem with, with, with the lack of celerity and uh, the, 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 time con the time between uh, uh, the, the, the initiation of the judicial process and the sentencing, especially in these processes which are, suspend are suspended. Because if you suspend one case for six months or a year or a year and a half, and then you're also in turn creating an obstacle to access to justice. And that's a, that's, a, that's a big problem we're facing now. What do we do? Because should we wait? 
But then how long is, is waiting is waiting okay? Okay, a month, two months, maybe. But then again, six months, eight months, a year, that is something that's really, really uh, 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 keeping my colleagues up at night thinking about this. And so I would like if you could like, Say, uh, say your share your thoughts about this situation and what it means to access the justice during the cases which are uh, currently running or suspended. Okay, I'm going to translate this to Portuguese in about one minute. I'll condense it and then, then Daniela can respond. Okay, so you just, just about nothing. Eu perguntei agora na Daniela sobre um problema que nós estamos enfrentando aqui no Brasil agora, que está levando alguns colegas realmente a perder o sono, que envolve o retorno às audiências. É, por meios telepresenciais. É, e como eu atuo em segundo grau, é um pouco mais fácil, que o contato é, é, é mínimo, e nós temos, então, algumas sessões telepresenciais que já estão sendo realizadas aqui em, no TRT da, da sexta região, né, a segunda turma, né, liderada pelo é, desembargador Fábio Faria, já, já está fazendo audiências é, telepresenciais, eu participei de uma ontem, inclusive, mas no primeiro grau isso vai ser realmente iniciado em tese a partir de agora. E o que eu discuti com ela é esses problemas que alguns juízes estão naturalmente apresentando, os advogados também, essa resistência natural, porque realizar audiências de instrução, com vida de testemunhas nesse cenário é algo efetivamente complexo. E, além desse problema, tem uma outra questão a considerar porque se você parte da premissa que daqui a um, dois ou três meses tudo vai voltar ao normal, podemos chamar de normal, nós vamos voltar até a audiência, tudo bem. Em princípio, isso é um caso típico, dá para esperar um ou dois ou três meses. Mas e se não ocorrer esse retorno nesse prazo tão curto? Se demorar até 2021, até o segundo semestre de 2021, ninguém pode afirmar que nós vamos, então, poder retornar àquela situação que nós estamos acostumados a ver diante de das varas, com aquele amontoado, aquela aglomeração de pessoas, as partes, os juízes, às vezes, numa sala de audiência super pequenininha, todos juntos, um do outro. Eu não sei quando isso efetivamente vai voltar a acontecer. Nós não temos como. Então, de repente, é uma discussão que envolve a ideia de razoar a duração do processo e, como consequência também, a própria ideia de acesso à justiça, essa possibilidade, não. Vamos aguardar para ter é, audiências presenciais e isso implicar, então, uma demora é, desproporcional para proteger aqueles direitos. Então, foi mais ou menos nessa linha que eu vou passar, então, né, a palavra agora para a Daniela, que já falou de forma tão brilhante, e vai, então, é, é, responder agora. E, após a exposição dela, eu faço uma síntese da respectiva resposta. Okay? E aí, o meu querido amigo Gustavo, que fala inglês bem, ele é muito enrolão, ele que fala muito bem, né, pode, a qualquer momento, se quiser já intervir. Ok, okay Daniela? Wonderful. Thank you, Sergio. Great question. Wonderful question. And I have to confess that I, I have not an answer for your question. I have the same question as you. I Something maybe important, um, maybe to clarify about the access to justice and the pandemic. Well, the, the access to justice in, I mean, ordinary courts, ordinary uh, trials has been limited and restricted uh, during the pandemic. And probably th this is un unevitable. So it's an inevitable has, has been inevitable, the restriction of other rights. So we have been, we, we have to be at home, inevitable. We can, our kids cannot go to the school is inevitable and access to justice is limited, is inevitable, which is really important to guarantee and has been important to guarantee during the pandemic is uh, to have a special, uh, I mean, to, to have an open door to precautionary measures, to urgent cases, uh, to prevent violations of gross violations of human rights or any rights, okay? But I have the same question as you. What are we going to do in the next few months or years? And it's probably more or less the same question with other rights. What are we going to do with the education? Are we going to educate people for a long time online? Only 30% of the schools could be online but the 70% of the students 
in schools and university have not enough access to technology. So same thing with the with the tribunals, same thing with the justice. It's, maybe it's really difficult to think how uh, could be access to justice in a trying to have a normal access to justice during an, an, an a normal exceptional situation. I don't have the answer. I think uh, I don't know. We have to we have to work and think in a parallel way. But right now, we have to think that maybe it could be in a long term and try to have I don't know maybe special procedures for normal trials in order to to, to have them uh, maybe online or maybe in situ, but with the special measures, distant measures and things like that. No, so it's the same problem with some other rights, and I don't know. I don't know what are we going to do, but we have to do it because the other problem problem uh, will be that after so many months with uh, trial suspended, we will have a, a rush. We will have a rush of of cases, new cases and old cases. All of them trying to have audience and trying to have. Uh, access to justice again at the same time. No? So I don't know what do you think, and maybe Susan too. I, I don't have the answer, and, it, and it's a concern for me. It's, it's really, it's a really big problem. Yeah. Okay, that was the first technical failure today. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Uh, it, it's true, like like you said in, 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 in the beginning of your lecture, your, your first lecture, your, your, your first uh, speech. Uh, we're in unprecedented times. We 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 we've never faced something like this, and not only like our generation, but older generations. Like my mother was saying the other day, like I never thought, I never heard of anything like this, and everything is new. And like I was telling my sons, I have, I have three boys who are in college, and they're like. Dad, when am I going to be able to go out? When am I going to go to see my friends? When am I going to go to see my professors, see my classes? And I like I have that no answer. I go, well, you better just start getting used to at least for the while these new methods that we're using, having classes online. And as a judge, also, and telling a lot of my friends, like I don't know what's going to happen, like the, the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months, or afterwards. Uh, uh, I, I think that progress. Like you can, you can have various ways of having progress. The, the usual way we take it step by step, but every once in a while you stumble, and when you stumble, you're thrown like thirty yards ahead. I think this COVID virus was a big rock in the middle of it, and we didn't see it, and we just stumbled, and we're gonna get up, and we're gonna be like thirty meters ahead. But it really is gonna gonna change a lot. I think uh, like the way I act as a judge, and my colleagues act as a judge, and and the, the clerks who work with us, our assistants, that we're, it's going to be totally different. Man. We, are, we, we were doing it a little bit now because we have a, 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 a electronic judicial process here in Brazil since 2013. But in the sense that we're going to be have, we're going to have to do, I think, the, the next months or weeks, that will really be something new. And I, I agree with you. I have no answer and I have nightmares about it. That's why I was thinking maybe Danielle has, has a sort of idea. But I think actually no one really has a, a like a for sure answer. We have ideas, but you said it. We have to face it. We have to face this challenge and, and, and live it up to it. I think that's probably the biggest challenge our generation is gonna gonna face is exactly this: how how to adapt. Like I, I always tell my students, uh, look, like Darwin said, man, adapt, adapt. You have to adapt to changing conditions. You know, I I, I call it like uh, like. Uh, Dynamic stability. You want stability? Stability like we like we had in the past doesn't exist anymore. You have to have a dynamic stability. Every day you have to adjust. You have to adapt to what's coming towards you. Watching out for what can kill you next, what can go after for you, and that's the way we're gonna have to learn how to live. So, so it was really, really incredible uh, hearing, getting your your insight, Daniela. Incredible pleasure and honor for us here. I'm gonna have to uh, rapidly translate, and then, and then. Oh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and ask my my leading question to Susan, 
And uh, so that you can think about it well, for about a minute, I'll do this translation. Well, Susan, you, you can continue that, that thought also that I had, Daniela, about the, that's, isn't that, that's really very interesting because I, I, it's a, that, that's what, that, that's what my, my thoughts are. Like, I, I study access to justice for more than 20 years, and I'm thinking, like, uh, my view is really going to have to broaden up because I think access to justice after the pandemic is going gonna, it, it, gonna to include things that usually we wouldn't think of, and it's going to be materialized in a different way also especially because like like uh, the, the, the the time is is, is running the, the clock is, is clicking but we have no idea when we're going to return to some sort of normality and the norm and the normality that we will arrive if it will be anything like what we had before or if it'll be uh, a real true brave new world that we're going to have to face afterwards okay i'm going to translate about one minute Bem, é, 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 é. Né? a Daniela respondeu, é, 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 dizendo que é Sérgio, tudo está em cima da mesa em termos de possibilidades. Eu não tenho uma resposta pronta para dizer né, como nós devemos encarar essa situação na busca por acesso à justiça. Na busca por acesso à justiça. É, 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 é. It's really cute, it's really cute, really cute. And, uh, 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 Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's great. That's great. That's great. It's really, really cute. Great meeting. Great meeting. And o que é acesso à justiça, né, dentro desse período de pandemia? E, e, e a preocupação dela também, que eu, eu fiz aquela uma colocação envolvendo e a preocupação com acesso à justiça sobre a ótica de que vamos aguardar a normalidade quando volta a audiências presenciais, por exemplo, aos nossos juízes de primeiro grau. O problema é que ele não sabe quando isso vai acontecer. Isso vai acontecer daqui a algumas semanas, daqui a alguns meses, só 2021. Isso efetivamente se apresenta como um problema. Porque você não pode falar em acesso à justiça quando você tem todos esses processos parados, aguardando a ideia de que um dia vamos voltar a ter é, audiências presenciais como elas eram antes. Então, a gente não tem certeza de absolutamente nada hoje. Isso efetivamente gera uma preocupação. Então, ela mencionou, Sérgio, eu, eu quero pensar que o que nós temos que fazer é encarar a situação e, e, e buscar solucionar da melhor forma possível. E foi o que eu respondi também. Adaptabilidade. A questão é que nós, nós, nós estamos sendo desafiados, desafio da nossa geração é exatamente, então, enfrentar, encarar essa situação, adaptando as novas, nos adaptando a essas novas condições para poder superar esses obstáculos. Bem, então, eu fiz a mesma pergunta para a Susan também, que eu queria ouvir a opinião dela, né, e perguntei para que ela, ela possa desenvolver mais eventualmente aquilo que ela não, não conseguiu é, no tempo que ela teve, já que aquela palestra dela foi é, tão, mara, tão maravilhosa, mas, mas curta devido ao, ao nosso tempo reduzido. Então, vou passar agora a palavra à Susan. Nós vimos ali, acredito que foi né, o filho dela que está querendo falar com a mamãe no dia do aniversário dela. Então, diga a ele que em, em cinco minutos nós vamos ter que encerrar de qualquer jeito. Não há problema. Ok, Susan? Thank okay. you so very much. And he is really cute. Really cute. Thank you. I'll tell him. He'll be very, he'll be very happy to hear that. <laughs> Although he would say, I know, mommy, I know. Uh, great, great. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, Sergio, I would say I think many people are uh, are feeling the same way in all of their respective fields. How do we imagine? The world, you know, that we will have in front of us, and um, and for legal proceedings, you know, I do think that it's better to begin taking some tentative steps now, because adaptation, resisting, like resisting what the future is, only only just delays the amount of time that adaptation is going to require. So doing things a little bit, uh, a little bit at the time. You know, as you push, as we all push the limits of our comfort zone, but just knowing that we do need to move forward and we do need to push the what what we imagine is possible um, requires an act of a, a leap of faith in oneself. Um, and I do believe that, especially this wonderful group that I'm speaking with today, that we have that within ourselves because we are all in the public service, and there's a part of us that has always try to think about the other and how we engage with the other as part of our work that is in a special way 
for judges, for prosecutors, for professors. Uh, we have a special responsibility for the public at large in various degrees. So I think that I believe we all have in, in all of us some of this spirit and we should tap that, tap into that. The, the other thing that I would say is, um, you know, um, I'm, I mean, I, like many people, I like my things the way they are. I like my habits. I like my holidays. I like my traditions. And, um, and it's unsettling when things change. But there is also a survivalist mentality, especially from immigrants, uh, children of immigrants, especially, uh, or children of refugees. Um, as a child of an immigrant, my reaction is, well, my father and my parents and their parents had to deal with some very, very difficult things where they did not know whether they would be alive or not. And I am now facing something like that too. And so what's the reaction? Well, their reaction, which I would like to take as an inspiration is to survive. They were survivors. They didn't let things happen to them. If the world wasn't being playing fair, well then they stepped out in the world and tried to make the world more fair. And so I, that's part of why I said that I was wanted to speak with people today instead of just, I could sit on my couch, but so what? Day, yes, I could be with my family, but I could also make a statement. I could make a difference by giving people the fight, the desire to fight and move forward. And to say that I don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring, but I sure as hell am gonna do my very best to make sure that what I believe and I think is right is something I am fighting for every single day. And if we put that on, then we can say what uh, Professor Lenza said, uh, Professor Barroso said last night in the meeting, Somos gladiadores. And in that case, like, yes, that's what we are, I think. So those are my, for the moment, those are my thoughts. Great, love, love those words, love those words. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I'll do a fast translation, then I'll come back in five seconds. Vou fazer então uma tradução rápida, assim, uma condensação, foi, foi emocionante realmente o depoimento da, da Susan. Em síntese, ela falou, ela falou duas coisas. Ela disse, olha, realmente nós não sabemos como vai ser o amanhã, mas nós que trabalhamos com o público, como professores, como profissionais de direito, juízes, servidores, assistentes, assessores e advogados, nós temos uma responsabilidade diferenciada. Né? Nós representamos algo para a sociedade e para a população. E diante dessa situação de desconhecer o amanhã, nós precisamos assumir esse, essa nossa responsabilidade e agir para fazer uma marca, para, para, para então, dar um passo e mostrar à sociedade que temos sim o um futuro. Eu não sei como exatamente vai ser esse futuro, mas eu tenho a coragem de enfrentar o que eu preciso enfrentar para defender todos os meus interesses. E ela, então, na segunda parte, ela mencionou algo que eu achei belíssimo. Ela disse, olha, eu vou é, 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 extrair algo dos meus pais, que, que foram imigrantes, que vieram para outra terra e tiveram que enfrentar dificuldades, mas eles foram corajosos em defender o que eles acreditavam que era ser certo. E é o que eu quero fazer. O recado que ela quis dar agora, um dia do aniversário dela, mas ela quis estar aqui conversando conosco, conversando com vocês que estão assistindo, dizendo que é, 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 eu, eu vou, até o final dos meus dias, lutar pela, por aquilo que eu acredito. Então, eu não sei como vai ser o amanhã, mas eu sei que eu vou lutar pelo que eu acredito que é certo. E vou ter a coragem e assumir atitudes, né, enfrentar o que eu tiver que enfrentar para defender isso no qual eu acredito. E essas são as palavras realmente de, de, de uma pessoa, de uma grandeza ímpar. De, de alguém assim que realmente eu já admirava antes eu admiro é, mais, mais ainda agora. Então, essa foi basicamente né, a, a síntese. Né? Nós temos que ter coragem de enfrentar um... Não, 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 vamos aguardar para ver o que é que acontece. Não, vamos encarar com calma, com, com, com é, ponderação, mas sabendo que nós vamos ter que enfrentar e ter a coragem de enfrentar esses tempos difíceis. Então, esse foi assim do, do, do recado que ela mencionou, lembrando aí da, da origem dela, da origem dos pais delas, que eu achei bem legal essa, essa parte. 
Okay, we have up. Oh, our time is just about up. So let's wrap it up real fast. Thank you, everyone. Gustavo, wonderful. You really thank you very much, English, man. You really you, you fooled me, guy. You fooled me. You fooled me. I was really worried. <laughs> But you were great. I you were really good. Really, really good. I'm very, he, very good. He was, he was running around the library in Boston College talking to everybody all the time. Yeah, yeah but he was all worried about it. So I got, I got worried also. So it was great. <laughs> really great interventions. Danielle, that was wonderful, wonderful. I, I have a, a, a view of things which I really only knew because I've heard uh, in one moment or another. But you gave me a totally different insight and i'm going to do some of my research using some of those pointers you have i'm glad that i still got your powerpoint so i'm going <laughs> to take some of those ideas and i'm going to work really thank you so much it was such a great honor and and it was fantastic hearing you today and susan thank you okay thank you and well, susan, thank you thank you so much oh okay it was great really great daniela i hope, hope to have you here another time also okay we're going to do this another time Wonderful. Maybe Great. after the pan the, the pandemic. <laughs> we'll talk Maybe. about it. And Susan, thank you so very much for sacrificing two hours of your time on your birthday to spend with us. Uh, you did send a message. You did make your mark. You, you influenced the lives of so many people, so many Brazilians, and you you, you did it here again, once again. And and if I was already your number one fan, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. Start a, a official fan club, official. Oh, club. Que lindo. And I'm going to be hoping. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to be hoping. Muito gentil, muito you know, for president, I don't know. Maybe someone will call you to be vice president. That'll be. <laughs> start. 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 But don't I would, give I, don't give any excuse to move to Brazil because I will go right away. Okay. Well, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, whatever. Well, whatever you do, man, you do with such passion. And and, and 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 such righteousness, the correct righteousness, which is very very admirable, and you you have all of our admiration. Thank you so very much for the thank both. You. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, superior also at Boston College for liberating you, for allowing you to participate. Now, Boston thank College you. and the Catholic University of Pernambuco, our sister thank schools and our sister schools. So that was really really wonderful, and we have to do this again. Okay, we have to do this again also. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Boa noite. Muito obrigada. Bye bye. Tchau. Tchau. Thank you. Thank you so much. Boa noite. Boa noite.